Hey, what's up, friends? Welcome to another episode of Seeking What They Sought. I'm one of your hosts, Anthony Leiter, and we are back again with another episode for you all. Now, we are excited for this episode because it is part two in our new series called What is an Adventist? It's a series where we are exploring that question. What is it exactly that makes up an Adventist? Is it a certain belief or set of beliefs? Is it the 28 fundamentals? Is it the way we hold hold scripture or, or uh, talk about truth? What is it exactly that makes us Adventist? And maybe, just maybe, Is there a little more room at the table than we originally thought? So that's the goal and that's the journey that we're on right now. If you missed last episode, that episode was an interview with General Conference President Ted Wilson and got to interview him, pick his brain, ask him that question. Hey, what is it that makes an Adventist? And uh, we had a pretty interesting conversation uh, with him. You can catch that wherever you listen to your podcast as well as YouTube now because as you can see, we are in video. So that's exciting. But yeah, make sure if you missed that to go and uh, give that a listen and uh, and then circle back. This week, we have an interview with Pastor Tim Gillespie. Now, uh, Pastor Tim is a pastor of a church called Crosswalk Church in Redlands, California. And uh, we get to sit down and ask him the exact same question. Hey, Pastor Tim, what is it that you think makes an Adventist? So without further ado, we're going to dive right in to this episode with Pastor Tim. Hey guys, welcome to Seeking What They Sought. My name is Jesse. I am super excited to be here with you. I'm here with Anthony and with Eric. We're, we're, we kicked Sean out for today. Sorry, Sean. Um, he said his kids were sick, but I don't believe that for a second. He's, Anyways, he's, a, he's at Disneyland. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but uh, we are here with Tim Gillespie. He is the teaching pastor of Crosswalk. Um, and I know that, so it's you were describing it to us that there is the teaching pastor of Crosswalk as a whole but then also there's all the local locations. So I don't know if you want to educate us a little bit on how that all, how all that works. Sure, sure. Um, so Crosswalk Church is a local church here in Redlands, California, but we've planted four or five churches over the last few years, and um, mainly video venues. Um, not 100%. Some of them have pastors, but it's a, it's a mix. And so um, that with our Love World groups, we call them, which are developing campuses. Um, I get to be the lead pastor here at Crosswalk Redlands, and then I'm the teaching pastor that goes across our whole platform. Nice. Nice. And this is a sort of a system that has been proven outside of Adventism, but I think it's probably the first time within Adventism that it's being tried. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's there's a few other multi-site churches around. I think there's some in D.C. and that sort of thing. Um, they're a little more districty, for lack of a better term, because um, all our campuses, we seek to kind of create a um, a consistent culture throughout all of them where some of the other churches feel like they're kind of more individualized churches with the same kind of centralized leadership, I think is what gotcha. it, what it seems like to me. So yeah, I think we're kind of the only ones doing this model right now. For sure. Yeah. Well, tell us a little bit about yourself. Did you grow up Adventist and always want to be a pastor? Like what, what was the journey? Uh, um, yeah, I grew up Adventist. I'm not sure I want to be a pastor now, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, I grew up Adventist. I grew up in, um, a theologian's home, actually, Dr. Mm. Bailey Gillespie, who, um, did the Valley Genesis research and that sort of thing in education. So I got to grow up with, um, with a really interesting version of Adventism. I would say all the West coast theologians were friends. And so mm. after, ch- after church, you know, haystacks, if they were at our house, there was a lot of a lot of interesting theological conversation, you know, Rick Rice and open theism. And then you've got um, mm. Charles Teal and social justice and uh, social gospel that he was teaching, Fritz Guy, uh, Madeline Haldeman. So so the the theological influences that kind of um, floated through our home, even when I was eight, and nine and 10 years old, were pretty significant. Not to mention the fact that my grandmother was a Beats. Um, mm. So if you know Gordon Beats, who was president of uh was southern president of southern oh, for a, little, okay. for a okay. minute yeah okay. for like 20 years um so that's my <laughs> like that's my like third cousin um and like 
my great uncle Arthur Arthur Beats was the the pastor at the White Memorial when the hospital was still down there back in the sixties, fifties, sixties in Glendale City Church. So yeah, um Dang. definitely come from Adventist stock, but got to grow up in a very particular kind of Adventism, which I find to be a pretty significant blessing. Mm. I mean, with that with that level of like pedigree, I mean, you probably could just like take your your uh, your lineage right back to Ellen White. Uh, oh yeah, no, like. absolutely. No, actually, no. But if you are German and live in North Dakota, chances are mm. we're definitely definitely related. Really nice. Wow. Yeah, my gotcha. grandfather had twenty two brothers and sisters. So. Wow. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. Dang. <laughs> Talk okay. about baby boomer. <laughs> well, it was a big it was a big farm, apparently. That's wow. what I understand. He just Dang. needed more workers. Yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So what was your journey to um to pastoring? Obviously you, you had this this shape shaping theology that you grew up with and maybe a different experience than it sounds like maybe others would have had um mm-hmm. with an amatism. But what was it, sort of the journey into maybe professional ministry for you? Sure. Um, so I got a, I think I was the first one at La Sierra to get a religious studies major as opposed to getting mm. a theology major. I think I was the first one that they offered that degree or I was the first one who took them up on it when they offered that degree. Mm. Always been interested in religion, got to travel, grew up going to, um, going to digs at Caesarea Maritima. My father was an archaeologist as well. So mm. grew up around religion, had friends that were, um, you know, from the Jewish tradition and from the, from the Muslim tradition. And um, so really had an opportunity to meet a lot of people. Religion has always been fascinating to me, but it's not something I necessarily wanted to do for a living. So I actually have a degree in English with an emphasis in writing and a degree in religious studies in undergraduate. I mm. um, was like one class shy of a teaching credential, but I kind of thought I was headed towards law. Um, mm. That's, where I, that's wow. what I was kind of interested in. And so, um, so <laughs> it's kind of a long story. I was playing in a band all this different stuff in LA and all this. And my dad, my senior year, my dad was in charge of all the seniors um, interviewing. Wait, sorry, Tim, can we, can we name drop that band that you were in? No, you know, it was, it was bad. It was called the Grazers. It was called the Grazers. (laughs) The Grazers. The Grazers. In my history, I've not been been good at naming bands. No, thank goodness it was before the digital age. So I've got some cassettes in my garage, like four left. Um, We were horrible, but it was fun. (laughs) That's been. Was this like a like like thrash metal or like like classical? It was kind of like pop. No, it was kind of we. We did. We were kind of punk, but not punk enough. So like we okay, played yeah. punk nights and people would spit on us. That was never fun. Oh wow! <laughs> but like we were a little heavier, a little faster than like the classic rock nights when we play in these clubs and stuff. So we nice. we were just generally hated. I think um, <laughs> generally never which quite fit in. <laughs> just and we, I, you know I don't think we were that good. Um, interestingly though, here's a little bit of trivia for you. Um, if you watch the show Peacemaker. Okay. Um, with John Cena, yeah, John Economos, the um, the big redheaded guy with the with the the yep. dyed beard. That was my college okay. roommate and my bass player in that band. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, wow. Steve Ag. Steve wow. Ag is his name. What a wow. I saw I saw That's pictures nice. with with you and him one time. I was like, I recognized that guy from something. I was like, how yeah. how does Tim know this guy? So he was also funny. outside Dave on the. New I was Girl. gonna say he was yeah, a homeless yeah. dude, and I remember, I remember that you knew him. Bro. Yeah, That's he's so my good. college roommate, man. That's so yeah, cool. He and I roomed up at PUC. He got kicked out, and then I didn't have a roommate anymore. It worked <laughs> out quite well for me, actually. Um, <laughs> Dang. But, yeah, that's so cool. But so no, you, so, you so were my not dad was, headed. You were not headed I was not, pastor. I was not planning on it by any means. I was doing some stuff. You know, if you play music and that sort of thing, you know, I was doing some song services and that sort of thing, just helping uh-huh. out. But then my dad says, hey, listen, I can't make the schedule work for all the seniors unless I put you on it. You know all these presidents anyway. They're family friends. So just like, why don't why don't you just do the interviews? And he was he was sneakier than like I was on, thinking at the on time. On his behalf? Or Yeah, or, or... he was just like he was just like, Can you just interview? Because like it'll make the schedule work for me. It'll be a lot easier. Oh. So I he you know. I think he was hoping that I would go into ministry. Anyway, the, so I walked <laughs> in the first interview and they offered me a job um, wow. with Southern California Conference. B.J. Christensen, who was the the I think that was his name, who was the um, president at the time, 
And my dad gave me a piece of advice. He said, listen, if anybody offers you a job, never say no to a job nobody's actually offering you. And I was like, what do you mean? And he said, well, they're not going to offer you a job. They're going to say, hey, we want to take your name to the committee to then offer you a job later. So he's like, say yes. If they offer you something, just say yes, because they're not actually offering you a job. So so I I was like, sure, that sounds interesting. And then uh, about three interviews later, um, I interviewed with Southeastern, who happened to be my uncle was the president at the time, <laughs> my my dad's nice. uh, brother-in-law. And so he actually did, wasn't in the interview. It was weird. I was in this interview, and Lynn Mallory was his name. He wasn't there. And halfway huh. through the interview, he comes walking out of a closet in this room. What? And I'm like, what? <laughs> What are you doing? And he's like, well, I didn't want it to seem like nepotism or anything. And I was like, yeah, but you could have sat anywhere, but not the closet. Um, That was kind of fun. That's amazing. So anyway, anyway, I got, I got, I ended up with three job offers and it kind of felt like I should probably listen a little bit. And so I took the one that would send me to graduate school and pay for that first. So we went directly to seminary um, from there. And then, then I got to seminary and was kind of shocked because I didn't really know Adventism. Mm. Because mm. you had the wrong version of Adventism in your upbringing. Well, I would say I had a different version, not the wrong version. <laughs> Sorry, I suppose that, was that my, depends that was on my, perspective. That was my tug in cheek way of saying yeah. it was different than the norm. It was different. It was different. Yeah. Um, seminary wow. was shocking to me, if you want to know the truth. Um, mm. Just some of the I, seminary is shocking for a couple of reasons. One, it wasn't that hard. I thought graduate school was going to be a lot, a lot harder. I thought it should have been. Um, <laughs> Can't confirm. But, but that's there, okay. Apparently. Yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying I'm brilliant, but I like it could have been. It, it should have been a little more rigorous at the time. I thought. Mm. But secondly, I was just I was just surprised at the state of the church and where the church was. Um, mm. You know, the language that was still being used, the the incredible oppressive nature that most people experienced. I mean, I would talk to mm. pastors who had been out in the field, and they were just like, "This is horrible." Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the church members are mean and you know, and it was like this, we're just going to suffer for Jesus. And I thought, man, I don't, I don't know if I want to do this, but wow. then, then, you know, I got really lucky because I went home for Thanksgiving. My wife and I went home for Thanksgiving that first year. And I got to interview down in San Diego at the La Mesa church. And they said, Hey, we'd like to hire you. We'll just wait for you to come back from seminary. So like three months into seminary, I knew where I was going. I knew I was mm. going to go live in San Diego when I was done. So mm. I was like, man, I can, I can do three years in Michigan. <laughs> right. And, and, and then, I, then I, I, you know, did my sentence and I got out. <laughs> That's, that is a great way of putting it. So Indeed. It, what it does sound like, though, is that you're, um, you ended up in pastoring somewhat accidentally. I mean, like through the, all those interviews and stuff like that, it was sort of like a, a really slow incremental process in that direction. Is that fair? Yeah, and I the reason why I went to seminary is because I was not sure that pastoring was something that I could do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, I shouldn't I shouldn't like go step into a church because a couple of the job offers were to start working immediately as an intern and, mm-hmm. you know, as a youth pastor or whatever. And I just wasn't sure that that's where I was. Mm-hmm. I mean, like the night before the interviews, I had been playing in a club. Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> And so I was like, oh, I, I guess I can't do that anymore. And um, so I went to seminary and started a rock band because nice, that, seemed, nice. that seemed reasonable. Um, <laughs> so That's I don't think awesome. I've done anything normally my whole career. <laughs> it's, worked, it's worked out quite well. Well, and, and so you started off in San Diego. I know you ended up at Loma Linda for a, for a while, if I'm correct on that. And then um, after that, spent a little bit time, spent a little bit of time out of pastoral ministry and then came back into crosswalk. Is that correct? What What was the, um, like coming into a place like crosswalk, I just want to give some pe- people who, who don't know the context, um, some more context here. I mean, it's Southern California. There's maybe a little bit more of like openness towards a more contemporary, progressive feel of Adventism. But when you walked into crosswalk, was it like that from the beginning? Was it something that you had a vision for, did it start off that way before you ever got there? Like, what was it like coming to that context? Yeah. So Crosswalk was planted in about 2003 by a buddy of mine who actually played in the band. Um, nice. It all comes the, back to in, the band. It, it does. <laughs> it does. So it is probably much of the criticism. Uh, but, <laughs> but yeah. Um, so Michael connect and I connected 
that's not a pun. That's, that's great. just <laughs> his last name. Um, we we got to know each other at seminary. He went to Hinsdale to, to to serve. We were still playing in the band. We were able to when I moved back out to California, we were able to get him an interview at Azure Hills. He became the young adult pastor at Azure Hills, and then he planted Crosswalk out of Azure Hills. He kind of daughtered mm-hmm. it out of Azure Hills. So so they had, had a, always had a contemporary quote unquote DNA. Um, it had, he left in 2010. It had started to kind of fall apart. I was working in the healthcare system and didn't see a whole lot of trajectory, um, uh, certainly at that healthcare system. And so it felt like it was maybe an opportunity to come back. I had learned a lot about innovation and design thinking. And I thought, man, I'd like to, I'd like to put all that work that I've done over the last three years, two and a half years into, um, into a church setting. And I had actually told our conference, like, Hey, why don't we start an innovation lab? Um, I'd love to run something like that, helping churches innovate and make good decisions and do some design thinking and work backwards. And they were, they were really keen for it. I think they were really positive on it. They just, you know, it was so far out of the box. They couldn't let it, couldn't make it happen. I think at the time. So, um, when crosswalk, when, so the position, there's a weird timeline on this, that I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure I a hundred percent understand. They asked me if I would come, they had a pastor. Um, but they were, they were off boarding that pastor. Um, I said I would be interested and, um, but this is what I'm going to do. I was very clear. I'm like, it's going to look like this. And in fact, they, I had preached there a few months before. And so they had asked me like what I thought of the church. And I was like, Oh, I don't know. Are you asking me like as somebody who might join it? Or are you asking me as someone Mm -hmm. like a church consultant? Because I was doing that at the time. Okay. And they were like, no, we'd like to know what it is. And so I put like a five page paper together kind of a narrative of what crosswalk should what i thought crosswalk should look like yeah and so um so the next call i got from them actually wasn't like a would you like we'd like to interview the next call was just would you come and be our pastor and i said to the i said to the conference i said do they want to interview me and sandy goes well it doesn't sound like it (laughs) i i think they think they know you (laughs) okay um and so, so yeah, I started in October, 2014, we had 85 people wow, in the wow. congregation. Wow. And wow. so we've, we've been blessed to have an opportunity to build a little bit different. From now, there. Huh? <laughs> it's, a little, yeah. it's a little bit different. Yeah. What's wow. uh, just again for content, what's your uh, like average weekly attendance at, at Redlands and mate, but I don't know if you know it. Yeah. Church, church, yeah. Like a organization. Yeah. Wide. In Redlands, we have about 1200, um, 12 to 1400 each week, usually, um, Easter, I think we had 1,800, so, oh, you know, awesome, but yeah. it's Easter. Yeah. Um, and that was just in our three services on Saturday, not on our Friday night and Sunday service. And then we have uh, Crosswalk New England, which has about 100, 125 every single week. We've got Crosswalk Chattanooga, which is our largest satellite campus, which has about 600 every yeah. week. Um We have Crosswalk LA, which is about, I think, 125 or so right now every week and then we have crosswalk portland that is about um they're about 250 i think 250 Mm -hmm. to 300 every week two services up there um then we've got some lovewell groups lovewell sacramento that has about 40 we have um i guess it's Folsom, but i think they call it sacramento then lovewell woodlands which is out in houston texas outside of houston texas in the woodlands they have i think between 40 and 50 then we've got crosswalk melbourne that um has i think australia Australia. yeah 20 20 to 30 there and then there's there's multiple other groups that we're developing and other Mm -hmm churches we're in conversation with about transitioning over to the crosswalk brand yeah so i mean you're you're a church of several thousand you know in, in active involvement mm-hmm. at this point uh, i just want to say this as a shout out uh, patty I, i'm sure you'll listen to this patty is the pastor of crosswalk portland and uh, uh, a mentor of of all of us guys on the podcast i just want to say patty you really need to step it up uh, so I just want to, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> he's never listening to me. Maybe he'll oh, listen man. to you guys now. <laughs> exactly. So Patty just wants you to just want you to hear that. Um, so, I mean, in this whole journey though, like this is a pretty different expression of Adventism, at least in the, in the forward facing elements of it by that. I mean, like your, the way the church service looks, the, the, uh, the style of, of, um, what people experience when they walk into the building, let alone the church service, let alone even the sort of the, the way things are talked about in, in that space. And so maybe let's talk about this a little bit. I, I'm curious about if you were to, to look at Adventism and define it, 
or like make maybe say more so what makes an Adventist? Mm. What would you say? What is it? What does it mean to be an Adventist? Um, so I, I think an Adventist is someone who um, doesn't believe in settled truth. Um, mm. I, we believe in present truth. We're non-credal. So we're a group of people. We should be, as I understand it, a group of people who are constantly seeking a better expression and a better understanding of truth. So I was on a panel one time and they had set the panel up from like what they perceived as the most conservative and to the most liberal. And I was late. Um, hmm. So I, I ended up on like the far end of the most liberal side, which I actually don't. <laughs> I, I, I think people may think I am. I don't, I'm not sure that I am. Um, depends on how you define those terms, I guess. Yeah. But um, there was a guy way on the conservative side that kept saying settled truth, settled truth. So I raised my hand. I said, are you an Avenist? I'm, I'm sorry. I don't know who you are. Um, are you an Avenist? And he was definitely what he would consider an Avenist. And he got a little offended and I said, well, you just keep saying this word that I'm, I'm confused by. I said, as Avenist, I don't know that we believe in settled truth. I've never heard that before. My understanding is that we believe in present truth, the way that God is continuing to unfold truth. Um, and so I think, I think a Seventh-day Adventist is somebody, A, who is interested in the second coming of Christ, believes in that, um, obviously has a passion for the Sabbath in the way that they define it. And then I think, um, thirdly, it's somebody who believes that God is continuing to speak, continuing to work, continuing to even speak prophetically through people, but is, um, we're A, not codifying that prophecy, if you will, um, yeah. which I think is a mistake that we've done in the past. And then I think that we are um, looking to see God's new revelation and this progressive revelation in our lives. So other than that, I think, mm. you know, to me, anybody who walks in my door, like you're an Adventist, that's fine. Mm. See, okay. That's not lot. what other people would say. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. I, and, and we've I, I we, we've had that. other guests on the series that might disagree. They would. Oh, no, they do. They investigate me too sometimes. <laughs> yeah. I think that who Anthony is talking about is Ted Wilson, <laughs> just to, not, since, not. since you're being ambiguous, um, hey. no, I just just to compare the two, um, what Ted talked about was um, was very much a very concrete version of what of what an Adventist was. What you are saying is a lot more loose, and I think some people would might be terrified about that. Well, you're using you're using a fundamentally different guiding principle. Yes, it seems. Uh, and I'm I'm curious where where do, where does that come from for you? And like, where do you source that? The idea of progressive truth, progressive revelation, and um, yeah, it it comes it as I understand it, it comes from our early church parents who decided mm -hmm. that we would be non credal Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we're non credal then it's not settled. Yeah. Mm. Right. Yeah. It's I mean, not like in, that's it's not by in a... definition. Right. Yeah. By definition, we're saying, "Hey, um, we we believe that God is continuing to reveal." We use the term "present truth." See, it's it's so it was such a Jesse. You may appreciate this. Randy Roberts, when I was working there, he was doing a like a twenty seven week series on Oh my why gosh, I'm, wow. why I'm an Avenist. You know, he Dang. goes in. Like he goes, well, I didn't know he had 27 weeks. He's series. no this joke. I don't know that he does anymore. <laughs> it was a long one. <laughs> and I, and I said to him, we were at, I think we were at staff meeting or something. I was like, Hey, um, I'm not going to listen to all 27 hours of this. Like, can you just give me like the, the wraparound? Tell, yeah. Tell me like, <laughs> why are you an Avenist? And he's the one, if I remember correctly, I, I shouldn't, I should be careful about quoting him, but I believe what he said to me was present truth. That's why, that's why I'm an mm. Avenist. To which I replied, and I don't know that he appreciated this, um, but I replied, oh, awesome. What are you going to let go of? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, Dang, yeah. I mean, there are things that are mutually exclusive, correct? For sure. We can't just, yeah. if, if truth is, if we believe in present truth and we are led to another truth, yeah, it may preclude a previous truth that we had. Yeah. It may be mm. something that are, you know, there may be truths that are mutually exclusive. Yes. For instance, yeah. For instance, it seems to me that if you're saved by grace, there's not a lot to say after that. <laughs> yes. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so that's going to push back on some of our traditional understandings of some of the other things mm -hmm. that we believe in. Mm -hmm. Right? Or maybe maybe it's going to shift the importance or or the um the emphasis on those other things. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
right? Because if you're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ, then really, I'm not really sure what else you can do to be more saved. Like you're not going to make the cross better by any action that you do, which by the way, that's not, that shouldn't be a shocking term. That's uh-huh. no, I think yeah. any people would agree with me on that. Mm-hmm. Okay. But what does that do to some of our other understandings? Right. It, it doesn't diminish them, but yeah. it certainly means that they may not be the same way that we understand them to be. Mm. They may not be, you know, a seal of something. <laughs> do, you, do you, would you be more specific about that? Because I, I, well, when you talk to people who maybe fall more in the traditional and conservative space, they'd say the same thing. We're saved by grace. Like there's, you know, there's, but I, I sense a difference in what you're saying. And I probably agree with you more than I agree with the other sp- other side of things, which is that, yeah, like if we're say if we say we're saved by grace, it definitely shifts how we talk about other things, let alone maybe even like how it's formulated in our either belief systems or things like that. So I'm curious about when you say it's not like it's it's for saved by grace. So then these other things aren't a seal of something. What what are you referring to, and why is that a pushback? Sure. Sure. I I heard a pastor one time said, I believe that, that we're saved by grace. I believe that we're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. I believe that we're saved by grace that leads us to Sabbath. And I believe the Sabbath is the end time seal of his people. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. I mean, that that's an interesting connection. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm comfortable with that. It's saved by grace, but then you're saying that. But then there's also this, and, and there's another thing as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I mean, listen. This is this is one of the reasons why, back in the day, a few friends and I put together the One Project, mm-hmm. right? We because because it felt like the conversation was, yeah, yeah, grace, we got that. But here's all the other things that you need to do in order to be saved. And they're really centric. They're like really avenue centric. And, um, and I think I just really struggled with a, the conversation always being pulled back to Adventism, Mm -hmm. which is a relatively, a relatively young movement in the grand tradition of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's a relatively small movement on the planet. Yeah. Um, I, I know in the, in the interview with Ted Wilson, he was talking about some pretty significant numbers, but those numbers are still nothing yeah oh yeah right at the end of the day i mean it's yeah. great it's great i'm glad the church is growing for sure but um but but relatively insignificant when you think about the billions of people that have lived so i for think sure. we need to be careful about being the focus of the end time because at the end of time we are definitely not the focus and i was just really tired of that conversation yeah right yeah. or wrong you don't have to agree with me many most probably haven't i was just tired as a pastor of talking about ourselves like yeah. it was mm-hmm. getting kind of gross yeah. Wow. And so we wanted to talk about Jesus again. And so we did. And we did, you know, I don't know, 37 gatherings in seven different countries. And we got investigated by the General Conference. So <laughs> that's and, fun. <laughs> and man, Tim, can I just talk to you about something? I just want to I just want to bring my gripes to you. Uh, the <laughs> amount of conversations that I've had to have with people who did not understand what was happening in the one project, the amount of people that were like convinced that there were crazy things going down on, it was on the our Jesuit. college campuses. It was the Jesuit because infiltration of you and Patty and, and uh, Sam and Jay Fett and all these guys who were part of that. I mean, like you had, because you did that, you, you took up so much of my time. I just want to make that. I just want to. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm glad. I'm glad we could help formulate your, your, Stepping into ministry. No, it was weird. It, <laughs> listen, it got weird. It got weird. It got super weird. I mean, I yeah. had a guy come up to me one time after one of our gatherings or in yeah. the middle of one of our gatherings. And he said, you know, I came here. I couldn't tell my church, hmm. um, you know, because they would, they would, you know, disfellowship me. But I came here, I came here last year because they sent me to see what was really going on. <laughs> to investigate. Yeah. And, and I started laughing. Back. No, wow. like I started laughing because I was like, that can't be real. Right. Okay. Normal, normal human beings don't function like that. Um, apparently they do. Um, <laughs> so he came cause he wanted to see how we were hypnotizing people. Yeah. Like legitimately, this yeah. is what wow. he's done to me. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, wow. And I said, but you came back and he's like, yeah, I thought it was great. Like it's the best <laughs> thing I've ever heard. The preaching was amazing. I'm reconnected with Jesus. So yeah, I came on my own dime. Well, but it's because you hypnotized him. 
Yeah. To, well, I mean, that's what a hypnotized person would say. There, listen, <laughs> in my head as he's saying this, he's like, I didn't see you guys hypnotizing anybody. And all I wanted to say is, how would you know? But that was not the appropriate <laughs> right. probably, moment probably not to make help. that happen. You guys would have got the joke. I'm not sure he would have. <laughs> yeah. But, but what, what sort of – what are the fruits? Mm -hmm. What are the fruits of that kind of theology and that kind of fear and that kind of mm -hmm. just, just uh, oppression of spirit? Mm -hmm. that he his church it wasn't even him it was his church thought he should go mm -hmm. and investigate this to somehow what protect god protect the church yeah we were a group of we mm -hmm. we were a pretty fun group of guys who really enjoyed laughing together and having great meals together and we wanted to invite other people into the conversations yeah. it mm -hmm. became subversive because it didn't sound avenist enough yeah mm. but i'm sorry if talking about jesus doesn't sound avenist enough i'm not sure that's our problem I think it's the culture. I think it's Maybe the culture's it's the, problem. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. And and just to yeah. just to give people context, if you don't know, the one project, what it ultimately was, is sort of a movement that that had a. It's most maybe its most forward facing aspect of it was that it was a, a several different conferences that happened like yearly, and there was also smaller things that would happen too. But pretty much a yearly conference where there would be several speakers, all of whom were professed Adventists. Um, as far as no, there was a couple of, I think like uh, you brought in. Um, I think we brought in John Orberg and Leonard Sweet. Yeah, those those, guys. yeah. So, but these, but I mean, almost everyone was a, a professed Adventist who loved Jesus and wanted to talk about that, and had, and it was. I mean, I've been to it. I know Anthony has, um, and it was. I mean, it was. It, it all felt like, yeah, this is Adventism. It's just a, it's pushing back against some of the unhealth, the perceived to be unhealthy um, aspects of Adventism, but, but. To to come back to your guys's motto or your your yeah. the tagline that went that went it went viral across a lot of Adventist spaces just Jesus period all period or as um, JFS says Jesus full stop all <laughs> full stop well he's he's British so. Yeah, yeah so you know <laughs> but um but it was that Jesus all and I and I've heard from many people. Um, again, this is a bit of my, this is a bit of the resentment I have in my heart towards <laughs> you guys starting this, is that I've had a lot of people talk to me and say, but like, but that's when, like, that's too simple. Yeah. Or something Jesus isn't to that effect. Isn't all. And yeah. like, like, what about the other doctrines and all that stuff? And I think you, the way you guys formulate it, it all points to Jesus, but, but so many people had an issue with that. And I think maybe if you could talk about that a little bit, because we, and that feels like a little bit of our dilemma in this, a lot of Adventist spaces. It's like, we believe in mm. Jesus, but there's mm -hmm. also this other stuff. Yeah. And you guys just went sure. back to Jesus all. Yeah. And I mean, it, what's interesting is that um, Ted Wilson in his interview with you guys said exactly the same thing. He said, all these doctrines lead us to Jesus. They all mm -hmm. lead us to Jesus, and, which is which is, by the way, as we were being investigated by the Biblical Research Institute, which if you didn't know, they investigate people, um, <laughs> which I didn't know. That Investigative was judgment. To me. It's Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. We believe in that. Um, in the midst of that conversation with them, like we, we all met at a conference office and sat down with these theologians, uh, one of them in the middle was like, what are you, why are we even here? Isn't this what we're all supposed to be about? Mm. And we're like, yeah, that's what, that's what we thought, you know. <laughs> well, um, but yeah, it was it was an interesting time because it, we didn't know how polarizing it would be. We didn't have any desire to be polarizing. I think what got us, I shouldn't say got us into trouble, we just wouldn't respond mm -hmm. when people would say, well, they're this and they're that and they're this. And my take on it was, listen, we don't have to respond. It is not our responsibility to respond to every single person who doesn't understand what we're doing. We're open yeah. book. Everything we've ever done is online. Yeah. We're not being subversive at all. I, I learned through that process that most criticism says more about the person criticizing than it does yeah. say about you. We got a lot of, well, you're just a bait and switch. You're just bringing people in and then switching the conversation. We really, really weren't. What's mm -hmm. fascinating now is I hear some of the very conservative pundits, some of the like the rock stars in the conservative world preaching sermons that Sam Lenore actually preached, like wow. like word for <laughs> word, they're <laughs> preaching his sermons, right? That's and wild. he got hey. so much criticism for it. Yeah. Um, but they are they are word for word preaching his sermons now. I've heard I've heard it in very public spaces. Some of these wow. guys preaching sermons that Sam, like I I one time just put my phone up. And was like, Sam, yeah. are you hearing this? Because these are your <laughs> words. That's crazy. Like, but but yeah, it was a it was an interesting time. And 
you know, it was a bit of a dividing line. And again, I'm not sure that we had planned on that, but it became a bit of a dividing line because it, it was, you know, my understanding is this, as far as what an Avenist is, an Avenist is somebody who is constantly seeking more understanding about the character of God through Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Somebody who is a disciple, right? They're interested. Well, uh, they're still engaged in study. They're growing. Um, and they have this eye on the second coming because they believe in the truth of that as well, mm-hmm. certainly. Um, and, and so that, that understanding um, somehow created such havoc within the Avenus world because it didn't sound right. Yeah. It didn't, we're, we're mm-hmm. not just about Jesus. We had people, I mean, we had people who put on weekend events oh, against yeah. us, right? Yeah. which was fascinating. People writing books about us when they'd never yep. spoken to us, which yep. is bad yeah. form, just for the record. <laughs> mm. Like if you're going to write a book about someone, maybe talk to them, just yep, like a phone right. call, maybe an email. <laughs> Yeah. You know, yeah. get some information. That Standard would be fascinating. Matthew 18 stuff. Um, you would think, but but no, that that's not the way it happened because because in the end when you're protecting everyone from another thing, you can do whatever you want. Whatever that that protection end justifies whatever means you're going to do. And what I saw through that just personally aside is the overwhelming places people will go in order to um, in order to discredit someone that they don't like or they fear. Wow. Like, and so I really appreciate what you guys are doing because you're, you're speaking to a broad spectrum. Um, you know, the, the problem with all of this is quite honestly, that you even have to talk to a broad spectrum is that (laughs) we, is that we feel like, um, within our tribe, we're against one another. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because our expressions are different because our language is different and because we emphasize different things. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, the criticism we get of Crosswalk pretty quickly when someone, you know, comes into our orbit is like the first question is, are you even an Avenist church? <laughs> because we don't we don't really look like an Avenist church. I've also become pretty aware that when they say that because it's working, they can't believe it's Avenist because they're really used to things in Adventism not working. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. And that's a, tr- that's kind of tragic. I think. Sorry. That that's... was just, that was the, that was the quietest takedown of how so many things in Adventism fail Real. <laughs> that are, but, or are in decline think, that I've ever heard. I feel like that touches on kind of a felt thing that like, you know, this whole idea of remnant, this idea like, Oh, like, w- like we should be persecuted or like it should yeah. be almost like borderline, failure all the time it, there should be this like oh we just got to grin and bear it like it's barely working or it's not working at all and that's all fruit of the fact that you know we're the remnant and we need to, you know it should look this this dismal yeah well that's that's just sacralizing failure honestly mm. that's all <laughs> yeah. that is like wow. let's make a theology out of failure and say we're better off for it we didn't need those people anyway um it's like it's mm. like it's funny because i i do a lot of church planting conferences and stuff and there's this we're we're We've been really good at, um, I think one of our, our greatest successes at Crosswalk and the movement has kind of been a reclamation ministry. People walk back mm. into a, to, uh, an Adventist church like Crosswalk that they haven't been in in 20 years. And they left yeah. for whoever knows what or whatever reason. Sometimes it's just irrelevance, right? And their kids got into sports and so they stopped going to church on Saturday. They walk in after 20 years and they look around the lobby and it's such a different experience. They go, oh, wow, I'm really, huh. I'll, I'll give this a try. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's become a huge part of our ministry is reclamation in these church planning conferences. There's kind of like this, well, we're, you're not going after the unchurch, So you don't, mm-hmm. you're not a real church planner. And I'm like, Oh, that's okay. I, I think, I think in the same way, um, you know, some people within our church look at what we're doing and say, that's not okay. You're not really reaching people for Christ. We're all really ready to leave people out of the kingdom of God because it's not our way. Mm. You know, I have to recognize the fact that there are revelation seminars that work. Yeah, for sure. Right. I don't think I could do one. Like I'm just (laughs) not really built. I'm not really built that way, but that doesn't mean that they don't work for certain people. And I think we should use every opportunity that we have to bring people into the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, what we need to make sure that we don't do is we need to make sure that we don't put burdens on people that Christ hasn't. Mm. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I think, I think that's one thing that Adventism can do at times is place burdens on people that Christ didn't place on them. 
And I, I think we need to be careful of that. And that, do, that I think do, that's because a lot of times we want to preserve culture. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, mm. I mean, do you mean by that, like, for instance, uh, the way that you that someone might keep Sabbath, that that's a burden that we place on people that... Sure. Is that sort of the, th- the idea of what you're saying? There? Sure. I think that's... I think, sure, that would be a good example of it. So, I mean, in all of this... I think I I mean to be honest I probably resonate more with how you talk about adventism than other spaces that I've that I've been in or heard talk about adventism but one of the things that is sort of a conundrum is that who gets to define adventism mm-hmm. like is it us here in southern california get to define a certain version of of adventism mm-hmm. or here on the west coast I mean a lot of us here on the west coast there's a just a bit maybe a bit of a difference compared to other places so do do we get to define a a, a certain type of Adventism and and then does the GC define Adventism? I mean, because one of the problems, we talked with a, a guy who's ex-Adventist and, and uh, his, his main point is that, well, the GC is who defines Adventism. And so like the, all these belief systems that are laid mm-hmm. out and the, all the wording of that, that's what Adventism is. And everyone who isn't that is, mm-hmm. I think the way he put it is Adventism light. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, in the sense that like, you're just, you're just not, you're not really an Adventist. Stuff. You're not really an Adventist because that's what defines it. And, and I think I think it is an interesting question. And so I'm kind of curious. What... I mean, to to piggyback, to touch on earlier, you know, you talked about present truth as a guiding principle. And would not the just to play devil's advocate, would not the pushback be right? Like, oh, that's you're you're kind of nitpicking, like a, a guiding principle. There aren't there other guiding principles like a return to truth, return to the Sabbath, like end time you know, prophecy emphasis, three angels messages, you're, are, are you not nitpicking on one guiding principle when there are actually others? Sure. I mean, that's the, that's the problem with the movement, right? That's a problem with the, a movement and a, pro, a problem with interpretation as well. I mean, like, let's take a stop sign, right? Um, we all interpret a stop sign differently. <laughs> hmm. I mean, true. It just means one thing by and large, yeah. but if you get there at three o'clock at night and there's nobody around, you're going to interpret Probably that stop sign it. pretty significantly differently than mm. you would at three o'clock in the afternoon with a cop on the other side of the <laughs> intersection. For yeah. sure. Right. And so, so yeah, we all get to interpret that. And um, to say that we don't is not only disingenuous in, in my book, it's, it's, it's willful ignorance. Honestly, when I have when I have a thousand people in my congregation, um, I have two thousand sets of ears mm. that are listening, and they hear a sermon for thirty minutes, and they are going to emphasize every one of those sets of ears is going to emphasize something different mm-hmm. that I said because mm-hmm. they're hearing it differently. They're hearing it from a different context, and I know this sounds relatively post or meta modern, right? But but yeah, 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 they are. You know, the 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 Indonesians in my congregation are going to hear it differently than the Filipinos in my congregation, than the right. Hispanics, yeah. than my people of color. Like they're going to hear things differently because their life experience is different. So mm-hmm. they're going to emphasize different things. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. To say that that doesn't happen within a movement of people, mm-hmm. then it's basically mm-hmm. to say that the individual person no longer has a say in the way that we experience things you know the Mm. the most the the most ridiculous question i get and i love it when someone comes to me they say pastor tim what do we believe about this and i'm always like Mm. i don't know what you believe i have no idea what you believe about it well no no no. what do we what do we believe what do we believe is avenus what do we believe Mm -hmm. there's 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 different interpretations within that there's theological conversations with within all of that Mm -hmm. we live in the tension of that that's what adventism is and by the way that's what any movement is is Mm -hmm. living in the tension of trying to seek out that truth mm. and when we find commonality and when it overlaps we celebrate it and when it when it diverges we either kill each other for it or we say hey that's interesting let's talk more mm. right i don't believe that consensus makes a definition necessarily of mm. a movement mm. because i just don't believe that somebody who identifies as a conservative avenist is a better avenist I don't believe that at all. It doesn't mean you believe in the second coming more than I do or the resurrection more than I do. You may actually believe less, but you're better at being a vegan. Hmm. That doesn't, I mean, I mean, is yeah. that, is that, are those, because if it's, listen, if it's lifestyle, that's pretty easy. Yeah. Right. right. 
Sure. Let's define it by lifestyle and culture. Yeah. Fine. You want to do it by music? Let's do that. Okay. We can do yeah. it by that. But I know some of the people that believe in the Bible, the absolute least would consider themselves the absolute most conservative Seventh-day Adventist. <laughs> they don't even mm. get to the Bible half the time. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right? So you're, you're, you're advocating for like that diversity of expression is like, it should be there. Like there should be. It like, is there. Yeah. It's a reality. Mm. It's not even mm. a, it's not even a question. In my book, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I mean, uh, listen. I know that my kids will think so differently about their worldview that they may believe the same things I do, but they believe them so differently they might not be the same things anymore. Mm. Well, yeah, I think I, I think I could see that in the world, but I think it almost even comes back to th how do we have guiding principles around something? How how could how could someone who right. holds say Ellen White to not be prophetic to not be prophetic in the way that maybe uh, prophetic or authoritative with the, yeah, yeah either way, yeah I guess that's a good distinction but I mean for for instance like you take that a whole idea and Ellen White is maybe I don't know how you'd put in a lot of traditional conservative spaces like she is incredibly important you if you were to do, to put her to the side you'd be doing away with a lot of Adventism. But even if you look at the spirit of prophecy belief, it, it, it pretty much emphasizes that we believe that we're going to have the gift of prophecy in the end, um, and we believe that that was manifested through Ellen White. Right? That's, that's, what the, that's the Adventist wording. We have, in we the have limited system. it to Ellen White. Which is, yeah, I, and I would agree, but that's how it's defined you know, in our belief system. In the twenty-eight, so, or in, in the twenty-eight fundamental, like wording. So how how can we? And I'm I'm asking this genuinely. Like, how do we deal with the tension of like, well, what if I don't believe that specifically, but I still look at this. I'm like, I'm I'm still Adventist, but someone else would say I'm not. Like, that's it. Does get into weird space because like at some point, are you so outside of any yeah. sort of norms that you are a completely different thing? How does that, how, how would you look at that? Well, I think it depends on, I mean, some of it depends on an organization. Is an organization interested in keeping some sort of purity or is an organization interested in keeping some sort of conversation, right? And how, how big is that tent? There are some people who would, who would broaden that tent and say, hey, you can believe very differently, but you're still a part of it because, um, I mean, it's, it's the, the, what is it? Loughborough quote, right? right? The quickest way to apostasy is to come up with a, a, a creedal statement of beliefs and then hold everybody accountable to it. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And he was actually saying, yeah, we're not going to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're not going to do that. Um, I, I think, I think first of all, if there's, if there's things that we can fall back on and know, those are the things that we see in scripture and the words of Jesus. When we talk about things like faith, hope, and love, that sort of thing, you know, what, what, are the, what is the greatest commandment? Those types of things. I think we can find commonality in that. Mm. Our expressions are always going to be different because um, mm. we're culturally different people and we're generationally different people. And, and the, the grand diversity of that is beautiful in my book. Um, even, from, even from traditional, you know, traditional worship services to the most contemporary or modern worship services, I think. Uh, I mean, in my book, all of that's just an expression of people and who they are and how they, the language that they speak and what they're comfortable with. Um, and that changes over time. You know, yeah. it'll, it'll change in 10 years from now. It'll be in 20 years from now. It'll be different. Um, I, I think that, I think that if, if the goal is to protect, you've got a certain mindset and, and you're gonna, you're gonna become exclusionary. If the goal is to accept, um, you're going to have a different mindset and yeah. that, that will always be, um, that will always be contentious within the church. Hmm. Right. When a conservative tells me they're conservative, my answer is, what are you conserving? Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Right. And when a progressive says they're progressive, my answer to that is, what are you progressing? Mm -hmm. Hmm. I'm, I'm not so interested in the label because there's no nuance in label. I'm more interested in the actual, what it is you're trying to do. Hmm. You know, if somebody says, That's I want my point. church to look like the church I grew up in. Okay, cool. Right. Not here. Probably not here. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Not at a crosswalk church. Yeah. And that's cool. 
you know, but my kids, when they grow up and they say, I want a church like the one I grew up in, it's going to look a little bit different. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so if somebody says, if somebody says, I want a church that loves, well, that's a different conversation. Right. We get to have a phenomenal conversation across, across cultural expressions about what love really means in the community. And that's Mm -hmm. a real conversation. Not, not, I don't like your music. Who cares? Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. But but what about these core things of Christianity, which, as I understand it, are us trying to um, follow in the ways of Jesus mm-hmm. when he said, you know, the greatest commandment is that you love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, strength and mind. And the second is like it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. Mm-hmm. So let's work on that. Let's get those pieces down. Yeah. Rather than rather than having a conversation a constant conversation about our own identity because mm-hmm. the truth is the truth is my identity is wrapped up fully in Christ yeah mm-hmm. at the end of the day right i mean that's what we are we're we're not adventists we're christians who believe <laughs> yeah. in the advent and look forward to the advent yeah. that's what we that's what we focused on right yeah at, if that's what we are then we've got to hold the tenets of those of of, of christianity and those words of jesus to be true mm-hmm Right. And and I think that, you know, what what we're doing is we're kind of having conversations over flashlights. Mm. Right. Explain lesser lights, lesser lights leading to greater lights. Mm. Like I'm all for flashlights, but I also really like the sun. And sometimes the (laughs) flashlight becomes a lot less effective when the sun's around. So I'm not going to keep Mm -hmm. looking for the flashlight when the sun is beating down on me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to drink in the nutrients that come from the sun. And the other one's Mm. fine. I don't have a problem with the other one. Flashlights are super important. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But, Mm -hmm. but, but you can't grow a plant with a flashlight. Yeah. You Mm. have to have the sun. I'm I'm pushing that metaphor. Yeah, the metaphor. (laughs) It's It's going to break down eventually. We'll get there. (laughs) But I so I that's what threatens people though. Sorry, Jesse, to cut you off. Go for it. That's I think what threatens people though. You know, for you to say, yeah, the flashlight's good, but like, especially when the Adventism that you grew up in or was given to you or handed to you is like, no, we have this distinctive truth and message and purpose and meaning and right, um, right. And I think that's what feels threatening about the idea. Like, no, let's just go back to the base. It's like, yeah, we can go back to the basics, but like, weren't we given a specific task or purpose or mission or message? I think that maybe that's the felt, right? The, the tension. Yeah, no, no. And I've heard that before. I certainly heard that before people, especially through the kind of one project years, people were like, mm. yeah, but, but our job is not to tell people about Jesus. Other churches right, That's the that. evangelicals. Right. Our, <laughs> right. our job. And it, and I, okay, but I don't, I don't want to. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Like hmm. I'm, I'm not done. I'm not done <laughs> telling the Jesus story. Hmm. Right. And I, and what's beautiful is I get to tell it within this context of the Seventh Day Adventist Church, which is a, hmm. which is a beautiful, a, a beautiful, you know, cradle for the story of Jesus. And I think some of the things that we got right is, you know, the, the idea of a whole person. Mm. Right. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's beautiful. I think health and, and, and wholeness is incredible. I think that's really important. I think we've made it weird, but people <laughs> do, right. People make anything weird. I know guys yeah. who love, love Toyota Land Cruiser so much. Like it's weird. <laughs> like it's the only thing we can talk about when we're together and that's, they're great people, but like, come on, man, there's some other stuff happening in the world. Yeah. Um, so so um, I think, I think we got that right, man. I think yeah. we got the mm. idea of the Sabbath is, incredible i Mm -hmm. it's in scripture i don't have a problem with it what what happens through creation what the gift that god gave us you know i've i've preached series on the sabbath and baptized you know 10 12 people after it because Mm -hmm. they fell in love with this idea that god gave them time Mm -hmm. and god wants a relationship with them and and you Mm -hmm. can't microwave that that intimacy with god and so Mm -hmm. he set he set aside time not because he needed it but because we needed it and we Mm -hmm. needed it to understand him and understand one another and understand ourselves Mm -hmm. right what Mm -hmm. what is why wouldn't i preach that that's amazing yeah and it's not a burden it's a gift it's a you know it's a diamond Mm-hmm. So that you, that can't get too big, but um, you know, but let's not get weird about it. I mean, I feel like 
a lot of what I've been preaching lately is let's not get weird, folks. <laughs> I was about mm. to say that. That's what it sounds like. If you could, if you could boil it down to a nutshell, you'd just be like, I believe in it. Let's just not get weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I mean, I guess we all get weird about we all get weird about stuff. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, but I, I listen. I and I also think that Adventism, at, at its at its best, kind of at its philosophical core, has this incredible opportunity to speak into a world that's that's. Not sure. And it's not our certainty that is going to inject itself into that world. It's our willingness to live in the mystery and seek present mm. truth and, mm. and sit with somebody and go, yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure I agree with all those previous definitions either. How can we how can we search for that together? How can mm-hmm, we yeah. mm-hmm. be on this journey with God together? Because you're right. We're non credal We didn't set it in stone. We're still mm. looking too. you're mm-hmm. searching. I'm searching. Of course, we're searching. This is a yeah. safe place to search. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And and I, I want to fully admit, because of how I grew up and this has taken me a long time to understand, because I didn't grow up with the oppression of a lot of things, a lot of the buttressing things of Adventism, yeah. um, not that they weren't there, not that we didn't talk about them, but it was very it was a very different relationship with them. Hmm. Um, it, was, it was much more academic and intellectual and, and not not like. That's the word I'm looking for. Not like holding on to these things for dear life because that's what makes us who they are. The mm-hmm. conversation mm-hmm. was always evolving. It was an always evolving conversation, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and so I want to recognize that, A, I don't have some baggage that other people do. And B, I think I'm a lot more optimistic and hopeful mm. because the Adventism that I grew up in was incredible. Yeah. It still had it wow. still had stuff. Like it still had weird stuff. But, but it wasn't. I didn't stay awake at night thinking I wasn't going to heaven mm. because I didn't keep the Sabbath correctly. Wow. Yeah. Right. Like I didn't, I didn't have to deal with that. The PTSD and trauma, the the real time trauma from that, like we, we not only need to repent, we need to put together rehab centers for people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's Literally. incredible right? how much damage just, the, yeah. like, it runs deep. That I think that's maybe even why, part of why we start started this podcast and just when you grow up in that space, then you have all, so many of your friends that grew up in that space and mm-hmm. maybe they left the church or have stayed, or you watch some people who reject it and then they, they maybe have kids. And so they come back to church and they go right back to their parents' Adventism or Christianity. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, and you're like, uh Oh, like, that's not, that's not great. But I think that's part of why we started to have these conversations. And yeah. so, but it, but that, that is something I noticed in the, the way you talk about Adventism. It's just different. It's different than, maybe that like yeah yeah we need to hold on to that but let's like you know let's expand on it a bit like you you hold on to onto it with a open with hands this, yeah with open hands but also a hopefulness and like a why wouldn't i why wouldn't i believe that why wouldn't i but it's not with that that attachment which is like the baggage i have to i have to i must yeah. you know which is surprising because i think a lot of people might project onto you oh tim's the super liberal he's super cynical and negative maybe, or, or he like, he's not like the fact to hear you say now that like, you're really hopeful about Adventism is, is maybe not how people would assume that you would think. Well, there's, there's two things I want to say, I suppose. One is the reason why, the reason why I haven't had the same relationship with those things, like many other people have had a, it's from growing up, but it it's assurance of salvation mm-hmm. at its mm-hmm. core the freedom that comes from knowing that I'm saved. Yeah. Mm. Right. And the Mm -hmm. rest is, the rest is some really great stuff, Yeah. but I know that I'm saved and it doesn't really, it's not because of that stuff. Yeah. Mm. Right. It's because of what Jesus did on the cross. And if somebody who says you can't be an Adventist because you believe too much in Jesus and what he did on the cross and his resurrection. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay. That's a dividing line that I think most of us who read scripture would be like, yeah, if that's not, if it's not okay, then okay, I'll go. Right. Um, yeah. But I, I think, I think the second reason, Anthony, is, or the second thing is, I've seen people come back to Christ with a different conversation through the Adventist Church. Our churches are not growing just because we have a good program. I mean, I hope we do. They're not growing just because we have good preaching. I hope, I hope we do. They're coming back to Christ because it's they're they're 
their theological understanding is changing. The emphasis has changed so much. Mm. And I think that's what we present through Crosswalk. And I think that's, that was my experience through the one project and the, what would a church look like if we preach that same sort of message of Jesus, full stop, all full stop, which by the way, is a very Trinitarian understanding. The Holy Mm. Spirit leads you to Jesus. Jesus is the full expression of God. So it's Mm -hmm. always all three all the time. You can't talk about Jesus and not be talking about all three because we are Trinitarians, right? right? We are monotheistic tri- Trinitarians, so it's yes. all one, all the time, yeah. mm-hmm. right? In mm-hmm. three, which some people get confused by. Um, but, but I, I've I've been involved in a movement. First of all, with the One Project, now with Crosswalk, I've been so blessed to be involved in these movements where people are being reclaimed for Christ, mm-hmm. and they're they're being reclaimed for Christ within the Adventist Church, and they are coming. Brand new people who have never seen Christ before are meeting yeah. Christ here. I baptized mm-hmm. two people. Um, two people at Easter. Well, we baptized 13, I think, but I, I got to baptize two at Easter um, who came in off the street on mm. a Saturday morning. They were confused. They thought it was Sunday. <laughs> wow. And church was happening. They were like, great. It took them a little while. They showed up the next week on Sunday and we're like, that, this is not the same church because we have a church that rents. And they're like, oh, and you must have been talking about the other guys. It was it was Saturday. They came back. We were able to <laughs> baptize them. Like, so. Oh, wow. So I'm hopeful because I've seen it. I spent a lot yeah. of time in institutional Adventism. Mm-hmm. I'm all for it. It's great. It's a it's a self-proclaiming prophecy and it's a self-sustaining system. Mm-hmm. Um, in the end, I didn't want to. I didn't see that as a a goal for me and my life to be in a in a system that's just self-perpetuating. I wanted something that was new, that was vibrant, that had the opportunity, and we kept innovating and finding people who wanted to do it. And um, I think the sky's the limit on what God can do with a movement within Adventism. And I think our theological core tenets are really beautiful. I yeah. think we've got some policy issues um, within the world church that need to be addressed. Um, and they need to be addressed differently in different areas and different places, which, you know, unity is not all together. Yeah. If we could Ugh. understand that, unity does not mean the same. That's something yeah. different. Right. And for some reason, we have a hard time with that nuance within the Seventh day Adventist Mm. Church. Because if we're not all reading the same Sabbath school lesson on the same week, then we might might not all believe the same things. Mm. Right. Right? Which is, which is, which is the lowest common denominator on trusting people. Yeah. Mm. And trusting the Spirit. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. If if the Holy Spirit is the one that leads us to all truth, we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. We'll be okay. But that's where it does seem like it's part of part of maybe the hallmarks of maybe more conservative or traditional spaces outside of religion too is maybe that fear of losing something, and so the mm-hmm. easier thing to do is to control what happens. And I and I say like I get I get that we 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 need conservative, we need liberal, we need we need it all because sometimes we can progress too fast and not know where we're going. But but I say this because that's I think maybe a sense of what I feel is being pushed back against by a lot of people um, that maybe we know who have left or, or still kind of are, have half a foot in, but not aren't really fully in the Adventist church is that there's just this feeling of like, they want to control everything that happens at the, at the local level when it's like, we're looking around it's like, man, God is moving through women. God is moving through these people. God, like God is, God is doing this stuff. And I don't know how you're going to argue with that one. And so that's just a, that's a, the way that you're talking about Adventism is far more, uh, and I don't, I don't mean this organizationally, but like there's that, that feeling of decentralization to a certain degree of like mm. the spirit of God mm-hmm. is trustworthy and we can trust him with our church. Uh, that's sort of more of what, I guess, maybe the attitude that I hear from you. Is that fair? Yeah, I think there's empires and there's kingdoms, right? Hmm. Um, yeah. And I think I think you know we all have to pay our taxes to the empire, mm-hmm. and and as a minister in the Seventh Day Adventist Church, I got to pay my taxes to that, and I got to you know give tithe, and I got to understand the policies and understand how to work through them or work with them or hopefully try to change them, right? Um, when they don't coincide with what I believe Scripture is saying, and there's a process for that, and mm-hmm. that's a yoke that that I've been given. And if God takes that yoke from me, then I'll go to the next place. But he hasn't. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm still here. I'm still called to this ministry. And I think that, um, you know, for whatever, for whatever reason, um, 
in in my ministry, which has not been a not been uncontroversial. Um, you know, I, I started a rock band in seminary that probably didn't, <laughs> probably was not auspicious. The, the smartest way to start a, 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 a ministerial career, there has been space. There's been space to do this. There's been space to play in a rock band in the Adventist church. There's been space to start a movement that tries to focus on Jesus. There's been space to plant churches in ways that have never been planted before within our tradition. There's been space to do that. I keep thinking there's not going to be, but there is. So I got to trust that the Holy Spirit has me here for a reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't love it all. I don't love it all. <laughs> yeah. But, but listen, I got three kids and I don't think they love it all growing up in my house. Like we're never going (laughs) to love everything, no matter what organization we belong to. Um, As, as long as I can continue to preach what I believe the gospel to be, as I interpret it through scripture and through my understanding, um, it's a good place to be. I I went through a crisis of faith faith quite a few years ago and I was asking everybody that I knew, like, you know, why'd you stay? And I think it was less a crisis of faith, but crisis of Adventism probably Mm -hmm. is what it was. Mm -hmm. I'll say that. And so I was asking people and like, I remember I was walking through Loma Linda university and the guy I was talking to was like, well, look at all this, look what God built here. I mean, if God wasn't in it, how could this have happened? And I had just been on the Apple campus like the week before. (laughs) And I was like, nah, I don't, okay. Like these buildings are not necessarily as cool, but okay. Um, like it just, nothing was, nothing was, Nothing you was must, making any you must sense. Have a, you must have an Android then, Tim. If you're, I mean, I feel like everyone who's fully into Apple is like God built this. <laughs> <At> this <point>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've read yeah. enough about I've read enough about Steve Jobs to know that he may have thought he was God. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not Fair. sure everyone else. Fair, did. yeah. But um, so I call I call up Rick Rice, um, who's I think one of the most brilliant theologians our church has ever had. And I said, Rick, why did you stay? You know, you're the kind of the author of open theism and, you know, the church savaged you over the years. Why did you stay? And I'm all prepared. Like, this is one of the brightest people I know. I'm prepared. I've got my my yellow pad out. I'm going to take notes on what he teaches me because I'm ready. Philosophical theologian. He's going to give me something good. And he said, he said, well, um, I met Jesus in this church Mm. and he hasn't asked me to leave yet. And that's after 50 years Dang. of of doing the work in the church, and Simple. that really that really kind of put me on my heels. If someone like that, who's way smarter than me, who who probably probably thought through faith way way more than I ever will, if it's as simple as that to him, I mm. think I'm I think I'm probably okay with that for me. Yeah. Because a lot of people do ask me, like, with what you're doing, how can you stay in the Adventist church? It's hard. It's way harder to do this, what we're doing in the Adventist church, than it is just to go plant churches, you know, yeah. keep, keeping all our money, keeping all our structure, doing it wherever mm-hmm. we want to. Um, but God has not called me out, hmm. you know. If the church kicks me out, then that's a different conversation. But they've been really gracious so far <laughs> and actually actually weirdly supportive. So yeah. I'm I feel really blessed to have the administrators that I do. And um, and that's kind of all up and down. I, I don't agree with all of them. You yeah. know, and they probably don't all agree with me, but they also know that when people are being reached for Christ, they want to give space. Yeah. Um, mm. And and most of the most of the administrators that I've met, barring a few, but by and large, most of them will say things like, I don't understand what you're doing, but it seems to be working. So I'm not going to get in the way of what God is doing. I mean, yeah. that's cool. Mm, yeah. That's, yeah. that's yeah. pretty awesome. So, so that's been my experience. I know it's not everybody's experience. And one thing, I, one thing, you know, you guys are still pretty young in the ministry and a lot of your generation has left. A lot of my generation has left too, but a lot of yours has left quickly. Mine mm. took a little longer Maybe, mm-hmm. maybe we weren't as smart to figure it out, I don't know. But, <laughs> but one thing I would say is that if you stay, the church opens up in a very different way, hmm. right? It's one thing when you're young and you got a pastor you like, or you don't like, or you feel like there's no trajectory. Like the church is a pretty big place and there's actually a lot of opportunity to be incredibly creative within it. Hmm. Um, and, and I think, I think if you stay long enough that you get some trust, mm. people give you a, people yeah. give you a pretty wide berth to do it what you can do, what you really feel God is calling you to do. And, and I found that to be true. And maybe my experience is, is weird. Like I said, I, you know, I, I haven't done things the normal way in my career, but, um, but 
I, I, I'm hopeful for the Adventist church because, um, because we're not in charge of it. Mm -hmm. I just don't believe that we're in charge of it. And if, if we are willing to go where the Holy Spirit, and we're so set up to do that because we're non-credal, because we believe in present truth, like all these Mm -hmm. things that Mm -hmm. like those, those, you know, early church printers, uh, why do they all own printing presses? It feels like, um, (laughs) but you know, they were like, Hey, let's not settle this down. Like we're putting things down in ink, but let's not, let's not put it down in stone. Right. For some reason. And, and I got to believe that that's God led. That's yeah. prophetic in the way that they mm-hmm. they understood that. They were pitching forward to the next generation saying, you guys may find out more. You may find out different. You may mm-hmm. find out better. Mm. Man, that's that's beautiful. Yeah, That is so beautiful. And I think that – and I'm just r- rambling here, so I'll stop. But um, <laughs> I, I'm just going to say if, if you stay, if you're in ministry and you stay and you do good work, you don't worry about – because at the end of the day, you're not going to change what's happening in Africa, should you? Mm. Unless you're in Africa, then you should probably. Um, yeah. But like, you know, from Texas, Anthony, that's not your job. Your job is to minister to those kids that God is placing in front of you. Yeah. Be faithful in that and see where that leads. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's been like, I'm not at the end, hopefully, hopefully, <laughs> maybe after this podcast. But it's like, it's been a really good, good life. And the people that have been touched through the ministry God has allowed me to do and the way I've been touched by the way God has put people in my life has been incredible. Um, Would I like our tithe system to be different? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Every day, every day I would like to have more money to plant churches, but absolutely. Yeah. You know what? We just keep going. Anyway, that's, that's a lot guys. Sorry. I said so much. No, you you said, but everything you said, it it, it presents a much hopeful, um, a much more hopeful and open space within Adventism. And I agree with you. I think, I think earlier, two years ago <laughs> or or more more but up until one about month ago, two, Jesse. yeah up until about two years ago i'd say <laughs> it just felt okay. like there was like there's there's there isn't space with an amatism to really be able to mm-hmm. to do much or at least to to succeed and and that was a bit of my own pride and my own um lack of lack of seeing my own failings and all this stuff but still it's easy to feel that way it I, is yeah it's quite easy to feel that way but what you've described i think i have seen more and more to be true that there is there is space with an amatism i love how you stated that there has been open opportunities. People have allowed for this to happen. And and what I think it's very easy to do is to look at, say, the GC or to look at maybe the more traditional spaces that tend to have a very Loctite view of what ought to happen and how it should happen. And to look at that and say, there's no room within Adventism. But it's almost like letting that co-opt what Adventism could become. Right. And I think that's sort of a, a shift in my own thinking to go from... Oh, like, you know, here we are just rebels. And it's, instead of just to actually own like, hey, I feel like I'm I'm deeply a part of this church, whether other people would say that or not. I feel as though I'm deeply part of this church and so that I can be part of helping to shape and form what it looks like in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years and maybe even beyond. It's like that's that's an, mm-hmm. a far more hopeful than just sitting there and like, well, everything sucks. So <laughs> no, I just, you're right. Uh, and and you get to you get to when you stay, right? You get mm-hmm. to like pe- young guys will come up to me, um, and, and young women in ministry and be like, "Hey, I want to do what you do. I want to go around and preach. I want to plant churches." And I was like, "Awesome, that's great." Um, but you got to do a week of prayer at Fresno Academy um, right. when you're 25. Yeah. Right. Cause that's what I did and stayed at somebody's house and stayed on their couch and it was super weird and <laughs> awkward. And like, <laughs> I, I had to do that too. And yeah. now I get to go to Australia and do a big camp, you know, because yeah. mm-hmm. it's super fun and they trust me to bring me over that I'm going to be solid yeah. and I'm not going to be crazy. But then they also get to hear, wait a second, you're building churches. How are you doing that? And so I get to sit in front of 800 people and tell them how it's working for us and yeah. get them excited and inspired to be able to do some of the same things. Yeah. Right. But, but, you know, it really is a question of ownership at the end of the day, right? If you uh, say they're telling me I can't do this, then you've given them all the power. And power is yeah. not real. You know yeah. that, right? Power is not real. I mean, it's real. I it's, suppose somebody could stop giving me a paycheck, but it's not so good yeah. that I couldn't replace that income pretty quickly. Probably mm-hmm. going to working at the mall at the T-Mobile store or something. <laughs> Right. We we yeah. don't we don't make so much money that we're in golden handcuffs stuck to these salaries that don't allow us, to, you know, that we can't, you know, I'm not making half a million dollars a year here. I'm I'm 
making a decent enough salary, I suppose, and I get to do what I want and God gives us some freedom and our church gives us some freedom. Um, but if I tell, if I say, oh, the GC is not going to let me do this. Well, first of all, I'm sure Ted is a really nice guy. I don't really talk to him every day <laughs> or, mm-hmm. or ever, mm-hmm. or yeah. ever, because, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of like the same thing we do with the church we've done. I think um, it has happened in America. Like we've made the mm. president and that conversation like an everyday conversation over lunch. Yeah. And the truth is like, I don't really like by and large, what he does is not going to make a huge effect on me if I yeah, just right. let him be his thing, but we've made it to be the center. And I think the one project was kind of that, did we make this too important? Mm-hmm. I think we did. Yeah. How do we, how do we, how do we stop that conversation? Cause we are having this, this is part of us. You know what? I think we can do it by talking about what we came into ministry for, which is Jesus. Mm-hmm. Right. And it did, mm-hmm. it changed me. It changed yeah. my perspective. Cause I don't think I would have made it. Yeah. I, I mm. definitely don't think I would have made it if I didn't have Jesus as the the center and circumference of my faith. It happens to be housed in Adventism, but if Adventism yeah. left you t- if Adventism left today, like this evening, I would still believe in Jesus, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My faith yeah. does not. My faith is is not dependent on my tradition. Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a uh, that's a really profound way of saying that. I just that. If your faith isn't isn't built on your tradition or isn't based on your tradition, isn't, isn't a, a contingent upon it, then there's still this beauty that like there's something transcendent beyond that, and that's what it seems like. Mm. If I really had to get to the core of what you're saying, is that there is this transcendence that we see that Jesus, like Jesus, is that that He transcends all of this as we focus on Him and grow in in our relationship with him and, and in doing what he would do, as you said, like love him, love, love God, love, love, our, our, love, the, love the world, love our neighbors, love, love others. As we do that, a lot of this other stuff just kind of falls away. Not that it, not that it's unimportant, but it definitely loses its, it, it, it falls down a few tears in, in, we, in how we, I, and how you hold it. Yeah. We've had a tendency to think that all theology is at the same level. Hmm. Hmm. Right. And yeah, that's yeah. not true. And scripture's well, not all on the fundamentals. same level. 28 yeah. fundamentals. They're all, they're all, it's a, that's a flat line. It's, yeah. it's not a, yeah, but it's not a flat line. Scripture's not a flat line. Yeah. Right. Why, For why sure. do some traditions stand up when they read the words of Jesus in church? They do it because they know those are more important. Right. Those are the most important things. The apex of scripture is Christ crucified, Christ resurrected. Mm-hmm. Like it all flows up to that. And then it all flows away from that. Yeah. Quite honestly, yeah. mm-hmm. and I think if we have, you know, our eschatological mindset has a tendency to be a little narcissistic at times. Mm-hmm. Scripture mm-hmm. is not about us. The book yeah. of Revelation is not about Avenus. It is the yeah. book of, Re- yeah. of the Revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus that Christ. is what it is. It yeah. actually says yeah. it. Like I'm not. That's not right. controversial. Like it's those the are the actual <laughs> words, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Just quoting the Bible. Don't hurt me. Right. So <laughs> but, if, but, if, but if all I'm doing the, is looking for myself within it, then I I've got a skewed view. But that's the pro, that's kind of the issue that we run into. I don't want to. I don't want to start a whole nother conversation as, as much as just to say that is sort of the thing that I think a lot of us feel is then you get into revelation and you're like, well, the remnant church is the Adventist church, or at least the Adventist church is going to be the remnant church in the end. And that's like, that's a, that's a held belief. I mean, it's on the back of our, um, it's on the back of our baptismal certificates. I had to sign that thing when I was 12, didn't think anything about it, looked back at it when I was like, I don't know, probably 23, 24. I was like, I signed that. Oh gosh. I don't know if I, I don't believe that. <laughs> um, and so, but that's that's sort of the issue that we run into, because we are reading a lot of ourselves into that story. And so, the way that you're talking about it is, I think, what I have come to see Scripture as, and I think it's a far more healthy perspective, which is that, no, this isn't actually about us. We are we can we are an outflow of of God's work, right? Like, I mean, we the church is the church is is, is the the uh, tangible hands and feet of God in this in this world. We get to be part of that. So, I, I fully agree with that, but. But we, our movement or our specific like version of this is not the thing we get to be, we get to be an outflow of the God that we meet in there. And that, like, that's just, it, it, it just, it changes, changes the, the focus subtly. And I think that's what you were saying about with one project. It's like it, it changed this, the focus from all of those 
peripherals back to the back to the center. It also changed. It sounded like your focus from the GC has all the power to wait. Hold on, like we can redefine some of this. I mean, that's that's a that's a cool way to just like, oh, hey, wow, we can recreate a lot of what this feels like. There's hope in this. There's we're not just the the people that have to become the remnant church and be faithful to the degree that we will have to make the end of world history happen. It's, it can feel like that sometimes. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it, it, it sort of takes the focus off of us. And that's, listen, it feels that's good. It, it feels good to be the center of attention. Like we, <laughs> yes. like, I mean, right. It would be great if the yeah. whole, uh, if the whole of the earth culminated in me. Wow. There's just like 7 billion other people on the planet. <laughs> I think it's eight now, they say. Yeah, so, I think it's yeah. like, you're right. I think it's like eight. So that means that there's probably, A, a there's probably a lot of people feeling the same way that I do, that I yeah. that they would love mm. to be the, the you know, they would love to be the center of this. Um, and, and chances are we're all wrong, right? Mm. And when I read, oh. when I read, when I read yeah. scripture, um, I, I, do I find myself in it? Yeah, sure. But I find myself in the identity of Christ first, mm -hmm. and then I figure out who I am. But yeah. if I go to Scripture to find myself, I will definitely find myself. But yeah. it will be a yeah. it will be a twisted and ugly version of myself. And what it'll do is it'll make me feel like, oh well, I'm probably not saved because now I actually see what salvation looks like, and it certainly doesn't look like my life. I mean, it's mm. like it's the whole reason why perfectionism mm -hmm. is such a such a tragic and and just terroristic kind of theology, mm. right? Because you're putting yourself up against something that you can never reach up to. Um, mm -hmm. It also you also like to be a perfectionist, you also have to deeply misunderstand sin and what sin oh, yeah. actually is and what, what sin actually does. Like it's all behavior based. So then what you do yeah. is you spend your life trying to be better. And so Jesus came to the mm -hmm. cross so that you wouldn't just be a jerk when you drive on the 91 freeway. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like that's, that doesn't seem like it's a big enough reason for Jesus to come. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, and, yeah. And, and so I just think, I just think, I think if we can, if we can shift that focus, um, but to respond to what you said, Tim, at GYC in the last decade, I don't remember exactly what year it was, a guy literally was preaching on this and, and said, I don't, I'm don't. i not saying you need to be perfect. God is saying you need to be perfect. And they just said that out loud to a bunch of like, you know, young people who are being formed spiritually. And it was, it was the most wild thing I had ever seen in theology. And I, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. But I said, they're like, what? That's, mm. This is one of the, you know, because it's the whole idea of, you know, in the end, you know, yeah, there will be this version of sinlessness that the energy. But I was like, that is that is oppressive to the max. And yeah. the way that you're talking about Adventist theology, which we would we would do, I mean, the way you're talking about biblical ideas that we would then say are 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 parts of Adventist theology is so much more freeing. It's like, why would I not believe in that? But also, there's this this hope that God will continually be growing me and growing us as a as a body. And then even beyond that, like, what if we're all wrong? Like, there's actually, I feel like there's a, a bit of there's a freedom, of hope, yeah, freedom in that. I was just yeah. like, hey, what if we're all wrong? I don't That's think we're, I don't think everybody's fully wrong, but like, I don't have to be the one who has truth to this degree that finally God will accept me. That's what it's, a, it's freeing. Let me give you one more. Let me give you one more metaphor that my dad gave me, and my wife's about to walk in here as I'm still <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> So she's walking back out. Um, uh, um, so signal. My my dad was my dad was talking about truth, and he said, "Listen, truth is is us standing on one side of a busy street, and God standing on the other side of the busy street, where there are um, there are eighteen wheelers going back and forth on this street, both both ways, and God yells yells out one two three four five six seven eight nine ten, and I'm standing on the other side of the street, and I catch one three five six and nine. Mm -hmm. Right. But but Jesse, you may be standing right beside me and you hear one, two, four, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Mm. Right. So we're all getting a piece of it and it's all truth. Yeah. But it's not all the same. So as we shape it, we think, oh, five is more important. Well, we agree on six. So maybe six more important. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we are uh -huh. we're seeing through a glass darkly. We're not getting the mm -hmm. perfect picture. We're doing the best that we can to continue to search, to continue to to continue to um seek the character of God. Mm -hmm. And anybody who says they have got a corner of the market on truth, we need to be careful of because that kind of certainty mm. leads to really strange things like, you know, people yep. drinking Kool-Aid and all dying in Guyana. And yeah. I mean, and I'm not, 
I'm not yeah. being facetious. Like it yeah, legitimately yeah. leads to that. It leads yeah. to Waco, Texas. It leads to all these types of things, right? Because one of the things that we do is we have a tendency to say that my interpretation is the only interpretation. It's right. This is the seeds of fundamentalism, right? Mm -hmm. So when when people don't believe like me, they're not only mistaken, but they're evil. And if they're right. evil, then I must be able to put them in a category where I can abuse them, where I can oppress them, where I can mm -hmm. dehumanize them. And so, you know, the biggest problem we have in not only not only religious thought, but also political thought, in my opinion, is fundamentalism. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we have to fight against that conservative or liberal. Honestly, yeah. we have to yeah. fight against mm -hmm. fundamentalism when it rears its ugly head. And yeah. that's what I worry about within the Avenist tradition mm -hmm. is more than anything is us saying, hey, we're fundamentalists, even though. Like you can't do a fundamentalist interpretation of scripture and actually be an Avenist. You know that hmm. you, you can't right. just like, you can't get to some of our doctrines, one in particular without <laughs> like, you gotta, you gotta be a little creative. Um, <laughs> you, you have to have a hermeneutic. If we had more time, I would love to if only we had unpack more. Oh, we're not going to talk about that. Um, <laughs> but, but fun, fundamentalism, is a, fundamentalism is really tragic. So, when we vilify somebody who doesn't look like us or sound like us or think like us or believe like us, mm -hmm. they become less than human and then they're not. And, you know, unfortunately, we've used remnant language mm -hmm. to cover that up. Oh, yeah. And we've said, mm -hmm. we've said we're remnant, they're yeah. not. If we're right. not careful, I don't think this is always the case, but that can be a form of fundamentalism yeah. that becomes really, really problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really important distinction, Tim. And I, I, I just want to personally thank you. And this may be circling back a little bit just for your distinction about ownership, because I think I talk to young pastors just out of undergrad, just like friends of mine. And they're just like, I just feel like there's no room for me mm -hmm. uh, in the expression of Adventism that I see. And I think what you're advocating for is like a, a paradigm shift of what it means to have ownership and what it means to, it's this sort of like, Rob Bell talks about like uh, having a view of um, separation versus a view of unity where he talks about uh, where like sometimes we'll complain, oh, on the internet these days, you know, it's so terrible when in reality, like you're the internet, you make what you <laughs> see on the internet. In fact, right. the algorithm gives you what you click on and look at and, <laughs> and, and want. And he talks about how, and that seems to be kind of what you were getting at, sort of like seeing yourself as, oh, this person has ownership over me rather than like, oh, I actually have ownership. Of, of, of the direction of this thing. Right. And you know, for all our bureaucracy in our church, for all, all our levels of, of management and all that, the local church, the local church pastor has an incredible amount of agency. Yeah. Mm. An incredible yeah. amount. Yep. And, and that's, that's the cool thing that you have been able to work within, you know, with Crosswalk and be able to do it. I, it tr Crosswalk truly is a movement that has saved Adventism for a lot of people. And I, mm. and I don't say that lightly. Sure. Um, mm, thank and, you. And, and it's a really cool thing to, to see um, as it, as it continues to move forward. Is there, um, I know you've mentioned the one project and Crosswalk. I'm sure there's some people who will listen to this and wonder, Hey, uh, I'd love to see my church <laughs> join something like that. What, what, uh, what are some of the places people could go to check out some of the the things you've talked about. Yeah, crosswalkvillage.com. Um, that's our website for our church. We live stream three times every Saturday. Um, we have series guides that go along with every single one of our, our series that we do um, and be a part of it. You can use that as a small group resource. You can use that as just a personal devotional resource. You get our app. It comes to you every single day, about 400 words, two or three questions um, having to do with the scripture that will be preached on that particular week. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, and then if you want to organize, just reach out to us, to myself, Tim, at CrosswalkVillage.com or office at Crosswalk Village. Really, put anything at CrosswalkVillage.com. It'll probably come <laughs> to us somehow. Um, and and we can get in contact and start talking about um, how we either integrate as a church, how you can use our material, because we record the sermon on Wednesday for our sites. And so that is available. That's why like we can have a group in Australia because they're it's Friday <laughs> afternoon for us, it's Saturday morning right. for them. But they have that. They have all yeah. those resources and material. And it seems to work on good days when people really build the experience around that video piece. Um, that's been really good. And then if you want to know anything about the one project, you can go to the one project.org. That's T H E one, the letter one, the number one, 
um, project.org, and that is um, currently being curated by my wife, interestingly enough. Wow. Um, she's managing all that. And so all the talks are there, and they do they do a thing called Salt Works every week, which is a conversation about some portion of Scripture. I think they're going through Acts right now, and Icky and Benamoa and Kyle Smith and some really great people are on there um, discussing Acts, uh, I think, right now. So, yeah, that's where you can join all the stuff we're doing. One last thing, Tim. This is for not all, not really for all of our listeners, but um, I just wanted to. You can say something that right now Patty can't can't respond to. If you if you could say anything to him right now, what that he can't yeah, respond a, to, what would it be? This is a golden moment. <laughs> Patty has an unhealthy fascination with donuts. Have you noticed this? <laughs> I didn't even like, know. I guess that's true. I know that he's by Blue Star Donuts, but it's it's maybe 30% of the content of communication that he has with <laughs> most people in his life. That's and amazing. I think it's un, it's unhealthy. I worry about diabetes. Yeah. I think it's the reason why the reason why he can't see very well and he's lost his hair. I'm really I'm really concerned for the brother, honestly. Like I have deep deep concerns. No, he loves you guys. And by the way, he calls you his boys. You're his yeah. boys. Wow. He's like, oh, you're gonna be, you're gonna be on the boys' podcast. I was like, I think I'm gonna be on the seeking what they saw. <laughs> I don't think they're called the boys. And he's like, no, no, they're my boys. They're my yeah. boys. I'm like, okay. Well, so he takes we... a lot of credit. He takes a lot of re- credit for you, but not much responsibility for you. I yeah. Like. No, actually, you know, it's yeah, smart. It's credit true, for all the good so. things. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much for being on the podcast, Tim. We really appreciate it. Appreciate everything it. that you're doing. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. Well, all right, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Seeking What They Sought. Before we rush to a close, wanted to just pause and say thank you. We are really, really grateful for you all, not only for listening, but for all the conversations that we've been having recently. After our first episode, we've only released one in the new series, and we've already had so many good conversations in the comment section, on Instagram, uh, from emails and messages, DMs, uh, text messages you've sent us if you know us. Uh, we are just really, really grateful for those conversations. They're the reason we did this podcast, and uh, we're just really, really uh, grateful for you all. So please, if you haven't, if you have thoughts and you haven't reached out, uh, please uh, send us an email um, or send us uh, just a DM on Instagram or uh, or you know drop a comment under one of the one of the posts. We would love to have conversations and uh, hear what you think. The second is a big thank you to uh, a group of people we haven't. I guess officially mentioned on uh, on on air, so to speak, yet. But uh, we wanted to just uh, take a moment and thank our Patreons. Now, if you didn't know, we actually have a Patreon. Uh, it's something that we mentioned uh, during the off season, but we really, really wanted to up the ante and be a little more intentional, a little more professional uh, going forward with this new series and going forward with the podcast in general. So we have started a Patreon. There are some fun, cool perks that you get for signing up. And uh, we actually have our first three Patreons already, and I just wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, Their names are Josue, Michael, and Aaron. We are super grateful for you guys. Thank you so much for already stepping in and uh, supporting us. It's uh, it's going a long way to, to help us make more content like this uh, for you guys, and we, we really appreciate it. So if you want to support us, you can hit up the Patreon. There's a link in our, our, our bio on Instagram, and uh, we would be really, really grateful. Well, I think that's just about it. So we will see you guys next time on Seeking What They Saw.